Thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight at the Farmers of Color Market Readiness Series. This is our fourth installment and it's all about accepting SNAP and EBT payments. Um, tonight we are joined by Rafi USA experts and then some other farmers, farmer market coordinators who are also going to talk about their experience accepting SNAP and EBT payments. Next slide. So I'm going to pass it off to my colleagues, Lisa Mish and Angel Woodrum. All right, and I'm going to throw it to Angel first to introduce herself, then I'll roll into my next slide. All right, well, hello, everyone. My name is Angel Woodrum. I'm sorry I don't have video tonight. When I was um, taking myself on video, it would make everything freeze. Um, so I apologize for that, but there's a picture so you can see what I look like. Um, but yes, I am at Rafi USA as the Farmers Market Nutrition Incentives Program Coordinator. Um, I've been here for almost two years in this position. Um, I work really closely with our farmers markets who accept SNAP, as well as um, offer incentives for using SNAP at farmers markets. Um, I've helped a lot of farmers and farmers markets get um, certified to accept SNAP. Um, so I hope that I will have some knowledge to share with you all. And my name is Lisa Mish. I'm the Director of Farmer Outreach and Technical Assistance at RAFI and have been here for a little over five years now. Uh, when I first started, I was in a position pretty much the same as Angel, where I was helping coordinate um, SNAP and Senate programs at North Carolina Farmers Markets. Um, and around the same time, I wrote and published a guide for how farmers markets can start a SNAP program. Um, I think we'll put the link to that guide in the chat. So if anyone here tonight is representing a farmer's market or sells at a farmer's market and would like kind of that specific information, uh, that's a really great resource. It, it's slightly North Carolina focused, but it definitely applies to, to any farmer's market um, in the country. Um, yeah, and then over the years, I've also helped um, other farmers kind of assess whether they want to accept SNAP and go through the process. Um, besides the market access work, I also do a lot of work within our farm advocacy program at RAFI around access to NRCS and FSA programs. All right, next slide. All right, so to start off, I wanted to give a big picture overview to, you know, what is SNAP? Why consider becoming a retailer, um, you know, for those that are coming in pretty fresh to, to this topic? Um, so SNAP stands for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It is the name of what was formerly called food stamps, um, and it is the name of the program that is the anti-hunger, what's con considered the nation's most important anti-hunger program. You will also see EBT, sometimes used in the same sentence or like in interchangeably with SNAP. That stands for Electronic Benefit Transfer, and it's pretty much the method for how a SNAP customer purchases something with their SNAP funds. So the EBT card is what someone would use to purchase using their SNAP benefits. Um, and I may use them interchangeably tonight too, but I'm pretty much referring to the same thing. In terms of use, over 41 million Americans use SNAP in 2021 at some point and received an average of $218 a month per person. Uh, so that's not an insignificant amount of the country. Um, and of those receiving SNAP, two thirds of those households had children, a third had seniors or individuals with disabilities. So this is monthly funds going on EBT cards for food purchases that can only be used for particular retailers that can accept it. So it's a, it's a really big proportion of dollars um, that if you don't accept SNAP, you can be missing out on. Uh, next slide. I also wanted to show the geographic distribution of SNAP use. Um, I think sometimes there's the, the idea that it's really focused in city and urban areas. Um, and while the, you know, the population is greater in cities, so there's, there's a lot of users of SNAP in cities. Um, in terms of SNAP use, it's more located within rural counties. And as you can see from both these maps, it's really within, there's a high concentration within um, Southeast rural counties. Um, which I know many of the people on the call tonight are from a, a rural a Southeast area. So um, 
definitely, you know, from an economic perspective, you may be really well poised to, um, you know, accept SNAP benefits just from, you know, a food security perspective. Um, you could play a really big role in giving SNAP customers in your community another option for local and fresh food. Next slide. Okay, and this chart is um, kind of gives a very simplistic <laughs> organizational structure of how um, SNAP is administered um, from the federal to the, the customer level. And I think this is useful because there's a lot of different offices and it can be confusing, you know, who am I talking to? Who's the right um, office to contact? SNAP is administered by the US Department of Agriculture and within the USDA, it's administered by the Food and Nutrition Services, um, which we may refer to as FNS throughout this webinar. When you go from the federal level, it then splits into retailer focused concerns versus the customer concerns um, or the SNAP client concerns. So on the client side, funds and administration would then go to the state level where there's some sort of state Department of Health and Human Services, and usually a division even within that, um, that deals with a lot of the program administration, it then goes down to the county level with a SNAP, a SNAP um, agency. And that's the one that's probably doing the most direct work with SNAP customers, getting them enrolled, helping them out with any um, EBT issues. If you're on the regional or on the retailer side of it, you're not gonna be contacting the state office or the county office really for any kind of retailer certification. Um, there are regional offices for retailers um, and this, there's one for the Southeast. I think there may be four or five other ones. Um, so again, if there were concerns you had as a retailer, you'd be contacting your regional office or the national um, SNAP retailer office. Next slide. All right, big question, what foods are eligible uh, for SNAP purchases? It's pretty much everything with a few exceptions, but pretty much everything, you know, fruits and vegetables, bread, dairy, meat, value added products. Um, and one that not everyone is aware, aware of is food bearing plants. So for instance, if you grow tomato transplants at the beginning of the season, you could sell those and, and um, make purchases with, with SNAP funds because those tomatoes, tomato plants will turn into tomatoes, which they can eat. Uh, next slide. Okay. In terms of what is ineligible, there are a number of things. Um, kind of the biggest one, non-food items, SNAP is for, for food. Um, so crafts, jewelry, soap, vitamins, medicines, Definitely not alcohol or tobacco products. Um, hot or prepared foods. This can be kind of a confusing gray area, especially for farmers markets where there might be a coffee cart or someone selling baked goods. Kind of the main, the main description is whether what's being sold is intended for immediate consumption. Like you're not supposed to be able to sell like a rotisserie chicken at a grocery store for SNAP because it's kind of intended for immediate consumption. Um, so coffee would fall into this um, category, or pretty much if you are giving someone something on a plate or a napkin, then it's, it's kind of intended for immediate consumption. Um, so that's an important one to, to highlight, again, if you're selling at a farmer's market where someone might be eating something right then. Um, and then delivery fees. This is kind of a newer one, but say you're selling um, like a food box on your website and then delivering it and processing a payment uh, the, the SNAP funds can only go, go towards the actual food products. Like if there was an additional delivery fee, um, they would have to pay that through cash or some other means because SNAP can only be used for food and not you know, additional fees. Next slide. And then uh, eligibility for the SNAP retailer. Um, just to start out, direct marketing farmers are definitely eligible to accept SNAP payments. There is a specific application just for them. Um, so that's, they, you, are, you are totally free to accept SNAP payments. Um, if you can meet one of the two food stocking rules, which I've listed here, I think pretty much everyone will probably fall into this 50% rule, which is when more than 50% of your total gross retail sales, which may include food or non-food products, 
more than 50% of that has to come from the sale of an eligible staple food, like the ones that are listed there. The other option is the staple food groups rule. And for that, you have to continually sell at least seven varieties of food within those four categories listed there. And at least three of those seven things need to be perishable foods. So that's a little more complex. Um, and again, I, I think most, most of the people would be able to meet that 50% rule. Um, and there's no, well, Angel can <laughs> confirm this when she does her part, but there's no real test. No one's coming out to, to check when you're doing the application. You just have to say, you, know, you meet this rule of, of food stocking. And next slide. And then I did want to talk a little bit about SNAP compliance, um, because when I talk with farmers and markets, I do hear quite a bit of anxiety about, you know, potentially getting penalized for something. So I want to kind of describe, you know, what are uh, retailers' requirements? Um, and really, the, the primary responsibility of the retailer is to ensure that you are only accepting SNAP benefits for SNAP eligible items. That's, that's the biggest thing. Um, so if, if someone's coming up to your stand and they have a mixture of eligible and non-eligible items, it's just being aware of using the SNAP for one and then processing a, a separate um, payment for the other items. There's also um, a requirement to post a SNAP abuse sign, which I, I've shown here um, in some visible place. Um, this is a requirement of any retailer. So the next time you're at a grocery store, you could kind of look around to see if you can see it anywhere. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the other requirement and, and that poster comes to you when you get your license. All right, next slide. Kind of continuing with potential penalties that could happen, it is within FNS's right to conduct unannounced on-site investigations or review your EBT data if they suspect some sort of violation of SNAP. Um, and there's kind of four different ways that you potentially could be penalized. Um, the first would be disqualification, either temporarily or permanently from the SNAP program. Or if your retail space is like, if, if it no longer accepted SNAP and it caused a hardship to people that shop there, they may let you continue, but issue a monetary penalty. Um, the responsible person who applied for that SNAP retailer license could be barred. Um, or in the case of intentional fraud or trafficking, there could be, you know, criminal punishment. Um, I will say, I don't think I've heard of any instance where FNS has gone on an on-site investigation of a farmer's market or a farm store. Um, doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but um, it, yeah, I've never heard of it. So I, I don't think it should cause much anxiety, again, if you are doing your due diligence of accepting um, SNAP payments only for SNAP eligible items. All right, next slide. Oh, and that, that was my last one. So I'll turn it over to Angel to talk about the application process. Yes, yeah, so um, the application process, um, this is where we will transition into talking kind of about the overview of the application. Um, and this is something that Rafi will help individuals and markets with. So just to throw that out here early, if you sit down, start doing this application and get hung up, like feel free to go to the Rafi website and find um, one of our emails um, to get in contact with a Rafi staff member. But um, I pulled some screenshots from the different websites that the USDA main site will take you to, um, just so you can see that, be familiar with what it looks like. So this first one, um, the link is in here. Um, so once you get the link to the um, slides, you'll be able to access this very easily. Um, and so here you have, um, get a USDA account um, on this web page. And so I've highlighted that in the red box. So you will need to make a USDA account first and foremost before you're able to access the application. Um, and so we can move to the next slide. And so this next slide is where that link will take you that I highlighted in red. And so this is just an account registration, just like registering for like a Gmail account or some other uh, social media account or something similar to that. 
um, you will need an email and you'll choose a password for this account. The only thing about registering an account that can be kind of weirdly worded is that you will select a customer as the type of user you are. So you are technically a customer of the USDA when you are registering for an account, um, which again, it sounds strange, um, but that is the way in which they word it. Um, so that's just something to take note of. And so once you answer these basic questions on this site to get your account set up, that is when you will be able to um, log in to the USDA portal to then complete your SNAP application. So we can move to the next slide. So yes, you. this, is, this slide comes from uh, the other basic website of the USDA for setting up a SNAP account. Um, and so you will see that I've highlighted this link that is complete the SNAP application. Um, and we've geared this market uh, readiness webinar more toward individual farmers. Um, applying as a farmer's market is a little different and then applying as kind of like a co-op is also a little different. Um, so a little bit of nuances, the application is pretty much the same. So the information is still pertinent if you are applying on behalf of a market um, or another collective entity. Um, but yeah, you'll see this um, complete SNAP application and this link will take you to the USDA portal where you will then log in and begin your SNAP application. And so this number three on this slide um, talks about submitting supporting documentation. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and on this slide, we have a list of information that you will need to apply to accept SNAP. Um, so I would suggest before you set down to begin your application that you go through this checklist and make sure you have all of this data on hand because that can just make the process a lot smoother. You'll already know what you need. Um, so you won't have any surprises. You won't have to pause in the middle of your application to hunt down some of these um, documents or um, data points. Um, so just to run through these a little bit. Um, so you'll need kind of basic information, basic business information like the day that your farm stand or market opened, the official name of the market. So if you have an LLC, you'll need to like pull the same information from those legal documents that you have or a lease or contracts etc. Whatever your official business name is, you'll need that for the application as well as your mailing address and the physical address um, if it's different than a mailing address. You will also need your personal information such as your own home address if that's different than your business or physical address. You'll need a social security number um, and a physical copy of your social security card, which that can also hold up the process because those tend to get lost um, sometimes. And so you may have to request a new one in order to do this. Um, and then you'll also need a responsible party. And so for an individual farm, this would be one of the business owners. If it's a farmer's market, that responsibility tends to fall on the board um, to make that decision. So it's typically like whoever is board president at that time. I usually tell people don't make that the market manager because market managers often um, transition out of market management positions and then everything is in their name and you'll have to do another application to change that responsible party. So whoever's kind of the most stable um, person, whoever you see being at that market the longest is kind of who I would recommend that person being. Um, you'll need your EIN number if you have one. Um, you'll need some sales data. Um, and I believe that is for what Lisa was talking about with that 50% rule um, to make sure that, you know, you're selling enough product that qualifies for SNAP purchasing. Um, so yeah, you'll need the variety of food types you have and as well as the market um, operating schedule. And this can be 
kind of ballpark because I know, you know, farmers markets or farm stands may close due to inclement weather or other things like that. So you don't need to be super exact on this, but just kind of your typical yearly schedule. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And so these are the documents that you will need in order to apply. So these are copies of a physical document. Um, so a photo ID of the responsible parties, um, social security card we talked about, any business licenses held. Um, and I typically tell people, even if you think the USDA may not need that, go ahead and do it. So if you have like a certified kitchen, if you have, you know, any kind of certification you need as a business owner for whatever business you are operating, just go ahead and make sure you have copies of those ready to send in. Um, IRS documentation, um, for, and this is for tax purposes for nonprofits. So some farmers markets will be nonprofits, um, some are not. So that really just depends on your tax status. Um, I would say probably the majority of farmers don't have to worry about the nonprofit status organization. Um, and then, um, uh, government ownership letters, if applicable. Um, so we can move to the next slide here. And so once you complete that um, application, and typically the application takes between 30 to 40 minutes, maybe up to an hour. Um, so once you complete that, you are able to submit it. And with that USDA login information, you are able to log in and check the status um, of that. And I've seen processes take, you know, two weeks up to a month. Um, so it really ranges as to how long it takes. Um, so if you notice it's kind of, you know, it's been a month and you haven't heard anything, I would definitely reach out to this SNAP Retailer Service Center. And I've heard um, farmers and farmers markets have had a lot of success working with the um, service office, which is really awesome um, and good to hear from a like a 1877 number. Um, and um, a few notes that I made on here. Um, again, the application can take a while to complete. It's not something that you kind of just plug in basic information and hit submit. And so it can be saved on that portal. So if you're, you know, working on it and then, you know, you have to go feed the chickens or go put out some fires around the farm, you can definitely save it and then log back in and go back to it. But it is deleted after 30 days if it's not submitted. So it's something to be, you know, a bit timely about, but you will have a month to complete it um, once you start it. Um, and in a rare case that you are denied by um, USDA oh, God, accept God. SNAP, um, the first step would definitely be calling this um, retail service center number um, just to find out why. Um, I did have one case where um, someone was denied SNAP certification um, and they weren't given a reason why, like in the kind of automated email. And so definitely calling and finding out what happened. It could be something as little as your address didn't match up to, you know, a Google Maps address or something like that. So it could be something really small that happened that you can correct really quick and then resubmit. Um, but that doesn't happen too often. I haven't heard of that happening to anyone I've helped except for just one person. Um, and so yeah, that's kind of the quick overview of the application. And uh, so we can move on to the next slide where we're going to talk about um, kind of SNAP uh, equipment. So these are, you know, the card readers that you can use. And um, I would say this can be, you know, convoluted and there's so many different choices. It's kind of like buying any new technology, like a new laptop or new phone. Um, there's a lot of different options that range in price. They range in compatibilities and they have different pros and cons. Um, so I'll just highlight a couple that I know people have worked with and said 
have been really great for them. Um, but I'll start by saying that if you already have a point of sale system to uh, swipe um, debit and credit cards, you should start there and see if that can be integrated or if EBT transactions can be integrated within that. So I know for sure that Squarespace can integrate that. Um, and so I know Square is a super common um, point of sale system for people. So if you have Square or another point of sale system, definitely start by contacting that service um, to see what your options are there, because that could potentially save you hundreds of dollars in buying equipment. Um, so just to highlight a couple of these, so the Total Pay Go, this first one listed here, I've heard great things about. Um, there also is a, they call it a grant program. So if you go to Market Link, um, Market Link's website, you should be able to find a program where they will give you SNAP equipment for free, which is amazing. Um, and I've had, a, about a handful of farmers markets this year that have gotten free equipment for um, this market link technology. And they have said wonderful things about the customer service side of it, as well as just getting it set up and they haven't had problems. So that's typically where I go um, or like the first place I recommend to people looking for SNAP equipment. Um, some other ones that I've heard good things about are these last two listed here, the Clover editions. Um, people have really liked, as well as Verifone. Um, and that the Verifone one, the third one down here, is a bit more on the um, cheaper side, but it's also a great product. I've heard great things about it. Um, and also a place that I point people to go is a lot of states will have programs that can help either fully cover a um, card reading device for EBT transactions um, or, you know, cover them completely. Um, so I would also start there kind of, as Lisa was talking about, every region has its own SNAP office. So you could start there and see. Um, for North Carolina people, I have a contact um, that I can put you in contact with and outside of North Carolina people, we could definitely help you figure that out. Um, and oh, another thing that I'll just throw out here is there are, so if you are in contact with your local farmer's market um, and you're interested in getting a SNAP transaction device, I would definitely go to that market manager and just see what they use. They are very knowledgeable about these um, if they accept SNAP, of course. Um, so that's also a good place just to get some, you know, hands-on um, knowledge of what devices are good. Um, so we can go to this next slide. So um, these next couple of slides are kind of talking about what to do once you are SNAP certified. Um, and so customer outreach is always a topic that I will get asked about either through emails or in various meetings um, at RAFI. And there are a ton of resources out there. Um, so, you know, you could do a couple of searches and probably find out, you know, good marketing campaigns um, to do, but I've pulled kind of the basics here. So signage is very important. Anywhere you advertise your business, I would suggest advertising what payment forms you accept. So cash, card, EBT, we'll talk about FMNP um, on the next slide. So anything you accept, I would definitely put on whatever signage you have out there. Um, oh, we can go back to the uh, last slide, please. Thank you. Um, and yeah, contacting different community services um, here. So like your county SNAP office, um, SNAP ed program, if your county has one, is a great way to get the word out. I've seen um, farmers markets give out small like quarters uh, page flyers to their um, SNAP county offices and they're more than happy to like pass those out to clients which is a great partnership to have um, as well as um, other just food um, 
I want to say ministries, but it doesn't have to be connected to a church, but food relief programs um, within the community is also a great place to go. Um, and then again, like contacting your local farmer's market to see where they're um, advertising at, as well as potentially um, getting the market manager to pass on information about, you know, a farm stand or a farm store since those tend to have longer hours than a farmer's market does. Um, could be a good way to go as well. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And so, yeah, we uh, here we have a slide on um, incentives. So as I said, I help coordinate our farmer's market incentive programs. And um, there's a definition for WIC and senior FMMP here. And so the important thing is um, just knowing that these programs similar to SNAP are to, you know, help out that household food income or money spent on food. And so there's a picture of one of the um, vouchers down here that you can see that it looks exactly like a check. Um, so if you see those floating around like your farmer's market or someone brings it to you, you kind of have an idea of what those look like. Um, and so with incentives, these incentives essentially double um, what SNAP dollars or sometimes FMMP dollars are being spent at market. So um, that can look like a 50% discount at your store um, or, you know, some similar um, discount or some other incentive, but typically it's um, found in doubling um, the um, dollars spent at market um, or at a farm stand. And so this other photo here is a token that um, these little wooden tokens that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with if you sell at a farmer's market. Um, it's just a form of currency that markets will use. And um, so that's kind of a brief overview of what incentives are. And then on the next slide, um, we can move to talks about the funding of how do I as an organization or a business owner get funding to offer these discounts or these double dollars. Um, and the answer, unfortunately, there's not just one place to go for the funding. Um, but there are a lot of different ways in which I've seen organizations fund programs. Um, RAFI, uh, for example, has funding through um, a health insurance company as well as the USDA. And so kind of the list that RAFI will give people to look at first is a local health agency. So this can be a hospital, a clinic, any kind of organization concerned about health within your community can get on board with, um, you know, healthy eating, incentivizing, as well as just accessibility. Um, individual donor campaigns is another one I've seen work well. Um, so this could look like, you know, taking individual donations, doing a larger campaign to fundraise for this, um, or it could look like, um, kind of pay it forward kind of models. So having some kind of campaign that's like, if you pay five extra dollars at your, at the register, this can go toward helping offset the cost for others. Um, so something like that. Um, I've seen this also in CSA models where people will have, um, buy a share, donate a share. So you can, you know, buy your share for the season and then put money toward another share for the season. And so farmers could potentially use those funds to create shares that are half off. So that would kind of be like a double bucks model as well for SNAP customers. Um, other community partners in the area like food councils are a great place if your county or city has a food council. Um, churches often will sponsor a week of a double bucks program or something like that. Of course, there's grants as well. Um, and kind of what I tell people as far as looking for grants is subscribing to newsletters. That's how I will hear about grants a lot. So I'll um, subscribe to various um, 
newsletters such as like a food council newsletter. Um, the self-help credit union is a great newsletter for funding. Every week they'll have a list of various projects that are being funded and agencies that fund those. Um, so really just kind of brainstorming and knowing what's in your area or even a national kind of newsletter. Um, and then these last two listed here are kind of nationwide or like more nationwide programs. So GUSNIP is a USDA grant that is offered, it opens every year, usually in the spring, um, in the early spring, and then it's usually due in the late spring or early summer. And this is more so grants that you could partner with other farmers with or other collectives or a farmer's market group could go in together um, to do. There are some pros, there are some cons to GUSNIP applications and um, that could, you know, totally be its own webinar. Um, so I won't go through all of those, but, you know, something to look into if you're interested, as well as Double Up Food Bucks. Um, so for people in North Carolina, and I saw some people from Kentucky, I'm pretty sure um, uh, there is a Kentucky organization that's funded through Double Up Food Bucks, at least in part. Um, but it, yeah, Double Up Food Bucks, it's, they will help farmers markets kind of across the country um, get double bucks programs started. I don't know their history so much of working with individual farmers, but it may be the same thing where you could go in with your farmers market or a group of farmers to inquire about that. And so, yeah, that's kind of the overview of the application process, as well as some additional info on advertising, on SNAP devices, um, as well as incentives. So we're going to open it up for questions now. I know that, you know, that's a lot of information and there's so many different nuances with um, everyone's situation. So yeah, we will now open it up for questions. Feel free to come off mute or add um, any questions to the chat box. Um, and we can probably stop sharing the screen for a moment. So we're, yeah. Any questions out there about the eligibility, application process, equipment? I have a quick question about Double Up Food Bucks. Um, so for those of us in North Carolina, I just went to the um, Double Up Food Bucks kind of website and trying to figure out what makes sense, where what it what it looks like in North Carolina. And it took me to the Mountain Wise uh, Double Up Food Bucks site. So for those of us who are in the Piedmont, what are our options there for that program? You know, I think for Double Up Food Bucks, you know, they, it's, it's kind of like a, more of a national organization and they might partner with particular organizations and states. And mm -hmm. so I think it's more luck of the draw if you end up being in a region that is served okay. by Double Food Bucks. Um, so uh, yeah, so I believe for North Carolina, it's mainly the Western side of the state. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I see a question about the associated fees. Um, good question. So. The, the slide that had the equipment um, table is a good one to reference back to when we go when we share them again. Um, it's free to get your SNAP license to be to be certified. That's free to get the equipment. There is usually a cost for the machine itself, unless you're using that market link program or a state program. Um, but then there are also monthly fees associated with using the equipment, and that usually comes from like some sort of software fee. Um, if you're needing to connect to Wi-Fi or use like a, a hotspot, if you're you know in the middle of a field, that can be an expense. Um, and then there's a transaction fee, which is um, pretty minimal. I think it's um, you know cents for for each transaction but that is another one that be included in a in a monthly um invoice so it's it's not completely free to accept snap i think that's a good thing to mention it's really um you know a way of increasing your customer base um and bringing in um and being able to to serve um those households 
Yeah, and I just um, saw a question about having a um, social security number um, if you're already providing an EIN number. And unless this has changed in the past year, I helped a farmer last year um, get SNAP certified and he did end up needing to have a social security number in addition to that. Um, so I doubt if that has changed. Um, and so I do believe you still have to have that social security as well. I see a question about whether you could use an existing equipment merchant, I'm thinking, um, or whether it, it cause, it's an additional fee. Um, I would first call that merchant and see if their device is compatible with EBT cards. Um, and, and if so, asking them about the fee, I would assume there would be an additional, um, if anything, the additional transaction fee. Um, but if, yeah, your existing merchant already uses it, that might be the simplest way to go. Okay, and I also see a question about working with a farmer alliance group, we would have, we would have to sign a point of a point person for the application. Yes, so if you're with like a larger farmer group, one person has to be the responsible official. Um, and like Angel said, kind of the person that might have the lo most longevity, um, would probably be the, the person to do that. Okay. And I got, I got a private message. If I sell via farmer's market, but the market itself does not accept SNAP, can I still apply to accept SNAP and be accepted? Yes. So if you want to accept SNAP yourself, whether you're at a farmer's market, a farm stand, um, a pop-up market, that is, is definitely an option. Um, and even if your market did accept SNAP, you could still apply to be a SNAP retailer yourself and use them in, in different places. And um, I just saw a question in the chat about how long to get reimbursed. Um, and I know the answer to this because I just had to ask a market manager this um, the other day. So. Um, the market manager said if they have a market on Saturday, they typically see those funds on a Monday. So it seems like a pretty quick turnaround. Okay, I'm reading this longer comment from Smith and um, yeah, I apologize. It was such a long drawn up process. I do know that anytime farmers are trying to apply with kind of a newer model, there can be difficulties because FNS is kind of a set older institution, like it doesn't move as well, it's not as agile with, you know, how markets are working. And so they may, they may not, yeah, get kind of the, the farm business. Um, so yeah, if, if you don't mind and, and wanna add your, your contact information or message, Angel and I privately um, be curious to, to learn more about what that is and to see if maybe, um, could reapply. I'm thinking if there are no other immediate questions, maybe we'll move to the next sec section and there'll be time at the end again if you have a questions and, and feel free to add things in the chat as we go. So Ray, I guess I'll, I'll turn it to you. All right, thank you. Um, I'm Ray Jeffers. I'm the Farm and Outreach Specialist for RAFI USA. I work through the Expanded Market Access Program, as well as with the Farmers of Color Network and on our policy team. We are joined tonight by Edith Barnes and Carlton Gay from Exceed Inc., as well as Ross uh, Mickens. And I don't have, um, it was on the slideshow there, Ross, you are from the Farm Open Door Farm. And so we're glad that you all are here with us tonight. And what we will do, we will ask each of you to introduce yourself, kind of talk a little bit about uh, why you um, chose to go with SNAP for your farmer market, as well as uh, how long you've been uh, accepting SNAP. And I think we can start with you, Edith. Oh, you're on mute, Edith. You're on mute, 
Is that better? We have you now. <laughs> okay. My name is Edith Barnes, and I work with the Executive Center for Economic and Educational Development. We are out of Greenville, North Carolina. We operate a mobile market, Access Connect, the name. We have been using SNAP since 2016. We started that uh, process in August, and we were fully approved by November, which was about 90 days, which you know wasn't that great. But um, we are approved. We've been using SNAP since then at our market, and it has certainly worked for us. Thank you, Carlton. Do you have anything to add and also tell us kind of what you do there at C? Okay, so my name is Carlton Gay. Um, I'm executive director here at Exceed. Um, like Edith said, we've been doing it since 2016. I would like to add that Access Connect is a mobile farmer's market. So that we, in setting up a mobile market, you may have a few additional steps you need to take as far as with, with the application process, because as a mobile market, you're gonna be termed a delivery route but you're the same information you're gonna give for being a, a, a farmer or a farmer's market is gonna be the same. One thing with the delivery route, you're gonna to have to have your vehicles part of your application process, the registrations of your vehicles, where you're gonna be set up because you're a mobile market, you've gone from different, different locations. Uh, FNS did at the beginning because we began some years back, they were a little hesitant to authorized more than one site, but through the uh, process, they did authorize more sites. And as a mobile market, we have a targeted uh, customer base. We work the food deserts. So we were able to go into the food deserts where there's limited access to healthy foods for the participants in those communities. So we're able to go in with SNAP um, uh, services and SNAP retailer. And with uh, double up bucks, we were able to also also offer those double up bucks at those locations that we uh, went to. But it's a good it's a good service to bring to marginalized communities. Thank you, Ross. Yes, my name is Ross Mickens. Um, my wife and I run Open Door Farm. We have about five acres of produce in production. Um, we've been selling since about 2012 at a lot of area farmers markets around Orange County, Chapel Hill area. Um, and since I, we've been with Carborough Farmers Market for about the last five years. Um, and one thing that's really significant there is our market manager, you know, makes it a, a real point to focus on utilization of like a double bucks program and, and funding around that. Great, thank you. We'll go right into our questions. Ross, I'll stay with you. Um, could you talk a little bit about the application process and what that was like for you? So our market is the um, considered the overall applicant. Um, in doing that, you know, we went with uh, a member of the board as the actual applicant. Um, but then each year, the individual vendors have to kind of re-up their certification to be able to still be eligible. So every year there's a series of uh, training and um, sorry, there's, there's a series of training and documents that that we have to complete each year to keep that. Thank you. Carlton and Edith, uh, any um, suggestions? Any, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your application process? It was very detailed uh, as far as applying for the SNAP. Is that what you're asking? As far yes, as ma'am. Okay. It was somewhat detailed in addition to what has already been stated from uh, Angel. They um, provide the hours of operation, having that designated person. And what we do is because the executive director seems to be very stable in that organization, he is the lead person in the application. So all documentation is really structured around him. 
We had to provide uh, detailed information concerning our organization, which is a 501c3. Um, we have been since 20, since 2011. Yeah, uh, we've been a 501c3 since 2011. So in applying for the SNAP, we were able to just structure, as I said, structure everything around him. And when I say structure everything around him, not only in providing information about the organization, the articles, articles of incorporation, the 501c letter, we had to give information concerning him, such as his, his social security number, his, um, his driver's license, because we are mobile, they ask for additional information. We had to provide the documentation for the vehicles that we were using, each and every one, show uh, the proof of insurance, um, we had to give copies of our license from the city. And because we are nonprofit, we didn't have to have them. We just had to be registered with the city that we work, were working in the city of Greenville and its surrounding areas. We had to do the vehicle registration. And most importantly, we had to do a letter of understanding with the state, saying, with, with SNAP, saying that, yes, we will be responsible for the compliance and the, and, and the operation of using the SNAP uh, services. We had to, you know, certify that through a letter. And in addition to that, after about six years, they come back to recertify you. As a matter of fact, today we receive uh, the recert recertifying um, information as to additional information that they needed again. And we have like 10 days to provide that. So we're busy on that, on getting that uh, recertification done. Anytime during that process, if you didn't have quite all of what you needed or sent in quite all of what you needed, were they workable with you on getting that in? Or are you kind of assigned to one person or do you call and ask a question and you might get whoever or? Well, their first rule, rule is you have to submit all the information with that um, packet. If they have like with us additional information that they needed because we are mobile, then they would send back another letter asking for that certain types of information and they give us maybe 10 days to get it in. And again, it has to be a complete packet or when they get it, it's deemed, you know, not complete. So we have to, you know, complete the package before submitting everything in. And we do have a person who we do, you know, who we can um, contact if we need to. Thank you. Anything to add, Carlton? Um, You're on mute. I would like to say with the startup <clears throat> process of the ap application, since we started back in 2016, some things have changed, but we had a lot of support from Rafi. Margaret came in at the very beginning and uh, um, she provided technical assistance and getting set up with the application and also finding the equipment to, uh, to use in the market. We went with TC, as a matter of fact, Rafi provided funding at that time. I, that was a good thing too. So we, we uh, came in at a good time, let's put it that way. We had a good run with Rafi. Carl, I'll stay with you. Could you talk a little bit about the impact uh, that it has had on your overall sales or customer reach since you've been able to accept SNAP? Yes, I certainly can. Uh, when we first started using uh, SNAP EBT and going to our customers, as a mobile market, we, did, we were able to set up in different locations in the communities. We had very minimal participation at the beginning. Even our, the participants were easy, actually leery of using SNAP with this mobile market. But over time, going back and becoming you know, familiar to the community, we did, we, we built that rapport and uh, we began to see a greater impact with the services. We were also able to add CSAs along the way, which is community for the agriculture food boxes. And our rep allowed us also with the double bucks to help to purchase those, help the participants to purchase those boxes at, uh, at half price. So the impact and how it impacted the organization, our actual, you know, revenues as far as Operating costs and operating funds actually increased with the SNAP participation because the, the, the customer base 
increase with, with this. Any uh, advice on how to build that rapport or to, you know, convince those uh, consumers to, to, to purchase from you that were leery in the beginning? How did you guys kind of overcome that? I think familiarity does it. If you stay with it, even though it may be a little bit slow or, you know, you might not get what you want at the beginning, if you stay with it, people will tend to kind of ease up to you, you know, come, come closer. Um, the only thing I can say is be persistent, you know, be, be, on, be there, be dependable, always be courteous to your uh, customers because they're already having to use, you know, SNAP benefits, some a little leery about that. They, you know, so you, you, you want to make it as friendly as you can for them. Bring them good products. I know you, be, you know, we're working with our farmers, our search of disadvantaged farmers. Sometimes we have to maybe pay a little more to offer a little less, but it works out in the end for the organization and for the community if you stay with it like that. So I'm saying, if you get into it, stay with it. It's not that, you know, not hard to do. And, and that will, you, you'll see an increase in both revenues and participation from the community. Great, thank you. Ross, um, I know you're the, uh, you're not the vendor, but you're selling on a market like Carborough that accepts SNAP and EBT. Was that a factor in you wanting to sell there or how have you seen maybe selling in markets that did not have that compared to one that does? Has that really made an impact on your sales? Definitely. I, I think, you know, just before COVID, before uh, that kind of that disruption, you know, we were probably seeing um, somewhere around five to 10% of our sales were actually coming from SNAP and EBT customers. And uh, the market at Carborough, you know, they've made a real push to try to reach out to the community and pull those customers into the marketplace. And uh, those incentives like the double bucks or having um, uh, kind of education events throughout the year have really kind of tried to pull more and more of those customers in. Um, now, after COVID between, I don't know if it's just um, the job market or a combination of that and supply chain issues, we've seen our SNAP and EBT use probably go up to about 15 to 20% for us as an individual vendor. Right. For the market overall, it's gone up by almost 300%, right? Um, and we're, what was interesting about that is a lot of those customers weren't coming to the market at all before COVID. And now that we're kind of getting back to normal, those people are still coming to the market. So it's actually been uh, a real benefit to all of the vendors involved that we now have these customers that are, are still coming out with us. Great, thank you. Carlton, Edith, uh, this next question may be more aligned with you all. You kind of told us a little bit how you were able to, um, Rafi was able to assist you with some of the equipment. But since you've had that equipment, is there any maintenance or updating or anything um, like that that really has to be done to that? Well, we have replaced the initial unit. And again, because we are remote, we're having to, you know, just really handle it a lot. And when right. you're handling the equipment, you know, things happen. So, you know, with that and the time use, we've had to replace it this year. As far as, you know, it being upgraded and updated every, with, with the computer and internet, it changes let's say, every day. So, you know, it's time to upgrade it. So we have gotten our first, first upgrade this year. And we did get the very phone. It is really a good piece of equipment. You can accept all cars, all cars, snap, credit cards, and just tap it and move on. It's really, really good piece of equipment. And it wasn't that expensive. If, you know, if you want to look at getting a piece of equipment, I would certainly look at that very phone. It is, it is wonderful. As far as with your, especially uh, Carlton and Edith with your mobile market, what considerations um, did you have when kind of deciding where to set up, you know, that day? Are you are you getting closer to maybe an area in the community that may, you know, utilize SNAP a little more than others? Or 
was that kind of factored in or uh, you know where your location is or um one one thing happened with was we became part of the farm and food council big county big county farm and food council and um we were requested basically requested to set up a market at the bss health department complex and uh, um there we're able to, to not only serve um, not participants, but employees of the county and others going and coming off of that site. Other consideration that we took into as, as we kind of moved to the community, looking at, um, it's kind of not, it's not easy to, to say that you just stop here, stop there. It, it takes a little bit of hit and miss, but like I say, in, in areas where that people are not really able to get to you, you can go, you can get to them. Um, you, you kind of find that out over time, you know, over, over you know, interacting with, with, with the community. So um, there's not really, uh, you know, um, template to go by to say, you know, who you're going to serve. You just, you know, you get, you're in that community and, and you're getting to be known. So, um, Food desert, we, we, as being part of the Farm Food Council, food insecurity is one of the focuses of the Food Council in Pitt County. So that, that gave us a kind of like a targeted end to reaching other communities because of the contact we had through that agency, through that. Um, Ross, uh, you know, then at the Carver's Market, uh, the Farmer's Market there in Carborough and, and other places you sell that, that accept EBT, uh, being the farmer, and I'm a farmer myself, are there any products that you see that uh, maybe purchase more from your EBT type customers or? You know, there's, there's certainly kind of a, a leaning towards simple, more familiar items, but I also see uh, just as much purchasing of some of the more exotic things. And I think the things like the Double Bucks program really help with that because people feel like they have some flexibility to experiment with something that they may not necessarily be familiar with. Um, probably our best example of that is we grow a lot of microgreens or pea shoots and uh, a lot of customers kind of gravitate towards that as, as something interesting that they can approach. You know, it's usually a product that can be eaten raw. So um, it is just accessible to folks that way. Right, thank you. We have some questions now, I think, coming into the chat. I don't know if I turn it over to you, Alicia, or you want me to kind of keep going. If you're done with your questions, Let's see what we have over here in the chat. So in the chat, and it was answered, right? What is the name of the POS system that they're using? It's Bare Phone. Um, it was asked in a more personal level, do you think it has improved your relationship building with customers by accepting SNAP and EBT payments? I do. Yeah. yeah. I could add to that one, yeah. especially. Um, it, I know it. you kind of have to be a little careful with people, right? Um, there's a certain stigma associated with using some of these programs and things. But I think, you know, if you're being discreet and treating them like people at the same time, right, then they they have a loyalty. Right. Just like any other customer, they're going to keep coming back once once you show them that, you know, you, you got something to offer them. And and then they especially the ones that are exploring. Right. If they're buying something that they may not have normally purchased and they're going to go try a new recipe or something like that, you kind of you're developing this conversation and this this personal relationship with them. And I, I think that's just great. I like to add to that. In the beginning, we had the flags that we were flying that we accept the EBT. And when persons passed by, they thought that was all we accepted was EBT. So after we stopped, you know, just flying the flag, flying the flags and just started posting the signs, 
then they you know start to increase others started to come so he's right um miss anita robertson mrs anita robertson has a question and her hand raised and she's unmuted so go ahead yes I really like the double bucks program. And as a farmer, could you please share if there's a special accounting that you have or reporting that's involved with the double bucks program that you have to report to FNS? And if so, how does that impact your daily operations and your business? Is that additional workload for you? And just curious, thank you. You ask me? Yes, there, there is uh, added um, paperwork with it, but it was more with the RAFI end because we were funded through RAFI with the double bucks. We had to account for all that we, you know, spend and what we had spent. Yes, we had to, you know, to keep track of, you know, who was used and who wasn't used. And it was somewhat of a private kind of thing, but, you know, we still had to account for it. And yeah, there, it was the additional work to it, but in the end, it was worth it. Yeah, we did the surveys with it. And again, there's a way you can do the survey with the customer that wasn't intimidating or make them feel like it was just something rushed through and letting them know that it was important, you know, to do it and then assist them with doing it. And then that's meeting too with, with the program in doing it. And then at the end of the month, you know, we had to do the report. But, you know, you were looking at pro probably less than an hour in work and doing it, but it was well worth it. Thank you. We had a question to come in about any additional requirements for online market sales. Um, not sure if any of you all are, are doing any online. <laughs> not a lot. Um, we did do some boxes online, but not a, not, not, not a lot certain promotion that we might have had a, a special drive, then that would be the only way we did online market. Lisa or Angel, do you have guys have anything to add maybe to the online sales part? Yeah, I can mention um, there are starting to be some platforms that will allow you to process an EBT payment online. I know local food marketplace is one of them, um, but I believe there are other ones out there. So I would do a search. Um, yeah, that's that's a subscription or you, know, you have to pay for an account and, and set up that whole store. Um, so another option that people did over the pandemic where they just needed a quick fix would be if you were using an online sales platform and if someone wanted to use their SNAP payment, you could give them some sort of discount code for you know Snapbox that would maybe like make it free on the site. So it would at least log the order and then when they came to pick up their box or whatever it was, then you could run the card. So that's kind of the, the loophole, um, but there are starting to be platforms that will do it directly on the site. Thank you. Alicia, I don't see any more um, questions that's coming to the chat. I will ask our panelists if they have anything they wanna wrap up with, uh, feel free. opportunity. I, I think it's a great opportunity for an organization to look into becoming a SNAP retailer because once you're in, you're going to reap the benefits, both financially as well as with your customer base. Thank you. Ross, I saw you. Did you come off mute or did you want to have anything to add to wrap up with? No, I mean, uh, he's pretty much said everything to be said about it, right? It's it's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit your community. It's it's a great part of our overall business plan now. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Alicia, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. And if Lisa, you want to unpin folks, there we go. Carolina is sharing the slides. Awesome. Here's our contact information. You've received multiple emails from me today and Friday. We also have Ray's email address and Lisa's up here on the website. We will be sending out all this information plus uh, uh, information for an evaluation. Carolina, next slide. It should be on there, right? Oh, this is Lisa's slide.
Yes, um, I, I did want to highlight one other program that RAPI is getting underway. Um, that is our Conservation Resources for Resilient Farms project. We have funding through the NRCS to specifically support farmers of color in the Southeast uh, to look at NRCS programs, um, identify resource concerns or conservation practices that NRCS might be able to pay for, um, and to provide assistance with applications and materials. Um, so if, if that sparks any interest for anyone and you want to maybe kind of get in line for some one-on-one -on -one assistance, um, contacting Jamie at that email there would be a great place to start. Uh, we also have a QR code on the side for a conservation assessment. If you have a few minutes, we would greatly encourage you to fill that out. Um, that's giving us a better understanding of what um, kind of top conservation priorities are on people's farm. And we're going to use that to develop webinars and trainings throughout the next year and a half. Um, and within that survey, you can also say, you know, whether you would like to be contacted for additional one-on-one -on -one support. Thank you, Lisa. And the final slide is the survey. I just put it in the chat. Um, and so did Carolina, so it's there, but we will be sending you an email with all this information. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight to learn about this important topic. And we will see you next time for our final installment on collectives and cooperatives in our market readiness series. So thank you and have a great evening.